All right. Uh, sorry for the delay. Uh, we'll get started here. This is uh, a demonstration of Istio in the Open Service Broker API. I may have said open source on the website, and that's because I had a typo. Some things we're going to talk about, just generally about us. We'll talk about a few Istio basics, as well as the Open Service Broker basics. We have a live demo. Talk about some of the th ways we want to enhance this demo and collaborate with the Istio community as well as Cloud Foundry to open up the scope of it and we'll take questions. So this is me. I just got married a few weeks ago in Vegas. If you could please tweet at my wife on Twitter and thank her for allowing me to come here, that'd be great. That's at B Willies. I work full time on Kubernetes mostly, though I also balance my time with Istio and other Cloud Native Foundation projects. Don't forget the underscore on there. Oh, yes, the underscore. Sam Luciano, without the underscore, is uh, a Canadian resident that owns some junk company, and uh, like a junk removal company, a lot more successful than I am. So remember the underscore. Hi, I'm Morgan. Um, I'm the horse guy on GitHub, and uh, I work on uh, Kubernetes now, but I was working on Docker before, uh, always at IBM, and uh, Docker maintainer and uh, Kubernetes member. And my main uh, work nowadays is the service catalog in Kubernetes, which is an implementation of the open service broker, the platform side. So I also have a Twitter, and it's there. And uh, cool. Move on. Okay, so a little bit about Istio. You may have heard mesh networks thrown around. This is an implementation, essentially, of a mesh network. Um, there's been a few talks that went over some of the basics of this. The goal is really to have some sort of a drop-in replacement to gain some functionality that you may have to build into client-side libraries. So Istio handles this with a sidecar-based approach. In the Kubernetes sense, uh, it gets injected into your pod, either through the command line utility or how we're going to do it today with the Open Search Broker API, which deploys an initializer. Uh, the initializer essentially just muddles with whatever you deployed normally, and then inserts in the necessary Istio bits to make your application part of the network. And a few of the features that it supports, uh, metrics collection and tracing are things that most people talk about. It's able to gather these things a, a little more easier than you instrumenting them, because it's capturing both the entry of the traffic and the exit of the traffic, so it sees the whole picture. Uh, the protocol level metrics that it collects are, are basically like HTTP metrics. It's able to capture some of your application specific metrics if you have them, um, but you would have to specify those to Istio. Mutual TLS authentication as well. Uh, like IPv6, that's one of those things that's like, yeah, well, we're going to do that next year. It's priority number one next year. Mutual TLS authentication, one of the big uh, features within Istio, and you're getting that for free. And then I'm going to talk a little more in detail about some of my favorite features, which are a little bit more difficult sometimes to build in without having your client libraries already. Thanks to Jason McGee for a few of these slides that I grabbed from because they were great. So traffic splitting is one of the things that I really like about Istio. It allows you to proportionally move traffic over between different services, either by a percentage based, as this example is showing, or you can use uh, header matching, so inspect for user X and direct to this instance, or enable this feature for user X. Circuit breaking is another big one. This is uh, if anyone's ever had a dependency or has been a dependency of someone else. Uh, you could be very familiar with like a stampeding approach if an other service started acting inappropriately, making a lot of calls to you, you're down, your service crashes. It's just a chain effect. So you can build in some level of retry logic within your uh, application, and this gets fed in using a configuration file similar to what we have here. And then failure injection. This is also a very neat feature. You can visualize what would happen to your application by just moving some sliders around and controlling the, the flow of the traffic in order to uh, detect 
what happens if one of your dependencies is going down? How exactly does that affect your service? What happens if there's a delayed response from that service? What's happening to your service? All right. Um, so part of this I'm bringing to the table here is the, the Open Service Broker API. This was uh, a piece of Cloud Foundry, the, the service broker, service catalog uh, piece that has been split off into its own uh, specification where we are defining both the, the server side and sort of the client side uh, interaction. And what it is is it's five uh, APIs, five resource endpoints that are defined to get a catalog, uh, create a instance of, of the service that you're defining, uh, bind the service to an application is the, the Cloud Foundry model, but uh, we're expanding that to uh, support sort of the Kubernetes way as well. Um, and then unbind and uh, delete the service. Um, we recently released the 2.13 spec, but right here is a, a link to the, uh, the 2.12 spec. Um, as it is right now, there's two sort of well-known platforms, one of which is obviously the Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, Cloud Controller implementation of it. And at least I would like to think that the Kubernetes platform is the other one. Uh, I have heard of other uh, platforms coming up and, and being created now, um, just at this conference, um, and what I have been uh, working on for the last year, I guess, or so, is the service catalog in Kubernetes, which is the platform side of the service broker uh, in Kubernetes, sort of the native Kubernetes-style API. Um, using Kubernetes objects, you, you can use cube control as if uh, this was a built-in thing like pods or deployments once it's installed. Um, API aggregation means that you can talk to the same cube server. Once you do a, a cube control you know, list APIs, it, it shows up in the API list like every other object. Um, and you can use cube control natively and there's no sort of friction other than the fact that the objects are kind of have weird names. Um, but we're improving that. Uh, in the last six days, uh, we've significantly changed the API, so some of the objects you'll see here probably don't exist anymore, but uh, it's alpha state, uh, and we're hopefully about to release the beta very soon. Um, okay, and then the last part of this is that uh, we have taken both the platform service catalog and we have created a broker, a service broker, a standard you know, interface. Um, and this broker is unfortunately right now specific to the Kubernetes platform, but in the future hopefully it would be great once uh, I hear a lot of work is going on to somehow support Istio in, in Cloud Foundry to uh, include the Cloud Foundry platform as well in, in support for this uh, as sort of a future goal. Um, in this case, the broker that, I, uh, that we've written r is going to be running in Kubernetes and it will be uh, serving the standard service broker API, which our service catalog will be the platform for and we will create Kubernetes objects to basically run through the uh, the API flow as if it's uh, just run through the API flow and, and deploy uh, Istio on there, deploy the broker, and then create a binding between uh, Istio and, and namespaces in Kubernetes. And uh, that, that way when you deploy apps into, the, into specific namespaces, you will Istioize the applications uh, versus having to do the, uh, what is it, Istio control inject. Instead of manually having to do it, it sort of automatically does it for you in the background using an initializer. And I think that is time for the demo. So what we're going to show is the service broker that we specifically created as a, for this demo. 
And as Morgan was saying, there's a few supported ways of getting a Istio to work with the inside of your cluster. And normally people will go with the Istio inject method, which uh, the documentation basically shows you using a kubectl command, and then it, it uh, shoots it over into another shell, which basically munges with your YAML and adds on things. And you have to remember to do this every time, otherwise the sidecar isn't going to be injected in there. Now, there's also just the, the initializer, which was published by the Istio team, um, that you could take and modify yourself. However, uh, then people have to have some inkling of how your deployment file is set up, a little more documentation. So in this sense, we decided to try out the service broker. And people that are familiar with uh, implementations of service brokers, this is going to feel very familiar to them. And there's a lot less steps for you to do. We're going to do this within a Kubernetes namespace, which represents some degree of tendency within Kubernetes. It's not strictly hardlined. Um, there's ideas even of combining namespaces together into a another tenant concept. But it's kind of the closest that we could come right now to having basically a group of developers in this namespace and a group of developers in this namespace. So here, uh, I'm just showing the Kubernetes dashboard for the demo. I have already in, brought up Kubernetes and just seeded the cluster with a few Istio components. So at this point, uh, the operator would then make sure that they are deploying both of the brokers so that individual could, developers could utilize them. And we package these up as Helm packages. It's not really important to note really what, what they do um, or, or the format that they're deployed in. But What is important is to note that we are first deploying the Kubernetes catalog. So this will provide basically the APIs to utilize uh, to hook in other brokers for, like our custom broker, it's providing almost like a menu system for here's all the applications that we're exposing within here. So that's going off, and it's creating two components of, right here. And then we're also going to, I'm just going to wait on those to come up. You can install the other program. Does it go well, yeah, side by side? Don't add it yet. Yeah. You can install it. Yeah. So this is our specific broker, which is going to register itself and expose the individual bits that we're controlling. So at this point, the Istio initializer has not been provisioned. It's just allowing you to provision one. So at this point, the operator is basically hands off. And now uh, an individual developer that wants to consume Istio within the side of their namespace. Green. We'll create a, uh, the broker link. Yeah, this, this is just a simple YAML that uh, says uh, add the broker uh, to the catalog, and you know, here's the URL that it's at, and here's the name that we're going to use in the future when we refer to it. Uh, once the broker is added, uh, we uh, there will be the plans, or there will be the classes, the service classes, and the service plans. Uh, for our broker, there's one service class and one plan on that service class because it, it does one thing. Um, there are no levels to it, and then we will create an instance of it. And then we will uh, create a binding uh, to, to a specific namespace. Uh, and you can see the parameter there is the namespace is going to be Istio test me. So we're creating the, we're registering the broker, and we're allowing someone to create uh, the initializer. But the, name is, the initializer has not been created at this point. You can see that here. Nothing has been created yet. No, but we have gone through the, you know, the service broker, the open service broker API, and we've, the catalog has been grabbed from the broker and, and registered, and all of that has been uh, gone into the controller that we have. And we have Kubernetes objects that represent all of those things. So 
So now we have an initializer. So what this means now is that one developer just said, hey, let's start using Istio within our namespace. Now, anything that gets created in this namespace is going to automatically be Istio enabled without anyone having to modify their deployment, remember those commands or anything. So to demonstrate this, uh, I have a simple example which is going to demonstrate some of the traffic shaping. I created a very special application which I effectively named Morgan Web. And this consists of two containers, uh, Morgan Web for Android and Morgan Web for iOS. Nothing specific to Istio within here. I'm not uh, specifying anything that resembles Istio. It's just a normal Kubernetes deployment and a normal Kubernetes service. You can see only one container is defined in each deployment. Oh, yes, very important. Not, not more than one. There should only be one container when we deploy this normally. So I'm specifying the Istio test me namespace that I created specifically for my team. And I'm creating that deployment in there. So now I've got two pods coming up. Can everyone see the text of this? I didn't increase the text size of the web quite too much. Was it an edit? A little better. Can anyone not see it? If you raise your hand. OK, great. So now if we go into one of these applications, we can see that necessary annotations have been set. And now we have two containers within here, uh, which is the proxy sidecar. Now this application is registered. So these can start talking to each other. They can start using the retry logic. Um, but I know you're not impressed. This is just showing the two containers could go in there. I'm just demonstrating basic Kubernetes features at this point. So where the real meat of this is going is I deployed one, for, one application for iOS and one for Android. So now what I want to do is when uh, coming from an Android device, I want to direct to the Android service. When coming from an iOS device, I want to direct to the iOS device. I'm not doing anything like super special here, but this is a feature of Istio. It's called a route rule. So I've got a bit of regex in there to search in the user agent header, which can sometimes be an unreliable way of doing this. Uh, but it, it's been working for me lately. Uh, and I'm, I'm targeting the specific application that I want these rules to affect. Uh, Android, iOS, that's, that's basically it there. So let me just create those. So I'm creating these not with the kubectl command, because I haven't tried that before. Um, but with the kubectl command. OK, so those route rules are created. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the Android emulator from the Android SDK. And I'm going to actually show you that I'm just not making stuff up. <laughs> so. This is the pointed to Minikube running on my machine. And this is the port that I have exposed to the public to access the service. I hard coded in the web page that you should be reaching the Android page. So if we don't see that, then something broke. Um, and it did break. <laughs> Yeah, somehow it ended up backwards. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> but for this, I already uh, pre recorded the demo in case you uh, wanted to see it actually working. We're seeing it working. It's backwards, but it's working. OK, so here we go. It's going to be a little smaller, but I uh, discovered that it's probably going to be smaller, and I ended up increasing the text size. Yep. 
This is some riveting opening up the uh, simulator, remembering where it is. So this is even starting from, uh, from scratch, essentially. It's booting up a fresh uh, iOS. It's the end you of stopped it. it? No, it's, it's the end of it. It's the wrong video, then. The short one. Oh, yeah, it did. Sorry about that. OK. So we're starting with essentially exactly what we did before. We have those route rules created. Now I stumble to open up one of the emulators after first showing it on my laptop, I suppose. If it doesn't find a header, which one does it go to? So that might be where I messed up like the, uh, the default rule. Um, so normally you would have like the default instance that you would just send things to if you screwed up a bit. Um, but I assure you this was working all of an hour ago when I tested it. So iOS. here we go. We have Morgan Web for iOS. I even refreshed it to prove that I wasn't kidding and going to some static website. It's beautiful. Then I struggle to open up the Android emulator. I go to the exact same URL. Then realize you probably can't see that, so I start extending the... Uh, it says size. Android. <laughs> and... Oh, there you go. Just at the end. Bam. Android. So this is a simple example of some of the traffic shifting abilities that you can use Istio for when your demo works. Um, but I'm sure it does work. I think I may have fat fingered something, which one of our colleagues said I might. But So future work, where are we going with these types of things? So the initializer is something that uh, some individuals on the Istio team that are working on the Istio service broker official uh, are interested in adding. Uh, they want to be able to maybe have this on just individual deployments instead of the per namespace. There's also a subtle bug that uh, in other namespaces at the moment, some things may not be working because it's trying to go to the initializer, but the initializer is just watching one namespace. There is a fix for this, um, but just if you try this at home, it, it's going to break on that moment when you try that. And I will have all the code for this available on GitHub along with the slides later on today as soon as I just slap on some licenses and whatnot. Uh, we're also interested in working with the Cloud Foundry team. I know that they have some PRs open and some stories open for the transparent proxy, which will be bringing Envoy in along with your individual service. Uh, as Morgan mentioned before, Istio largely only runs on Kubernetes right now, though in the latest release, it does allow you to bring VMs on the outside into your existing Istio cluster, assuming your original Istio cluster started on Kubernetes. Um, really, the goal is just having a common service discovery mechanism that people can you know, swap in with their cloud provider. If you want to catch me uh, after this, uh, these are topics, technical topics that I like to talk about. And if you don't want to talk about those, these are some other things that I know some stuff about. And just talk to Morgan in general. In general. Yeah. I didn't create a big question slide, but ready for questions. Good. Oh, God. The Istio one? It's create okay. So when we do the instance, it doesn't really do much. It it it, it instantializes the uh, the registration in in Kubernetes. It creates the initializer registration, which is just a thing that says uh, in the future everything that comes in needs to go through this initializer. It doesn't actually create the initializer, which means uh, until you actually create the initializer, everything is broken. 
So that's not great, but uh, we wanted to try to get uh, binding I fixed, and I fixed instances that in. The demo, in. Actually. But then when you do the binding, that is where it actually uh, sets up the initializer for the specific namespace in the parameters of the binding. So what's the initializer do? The initializer is the thing that when a deployment comes in, it uh, munges the deployment somehow, and in our case, uh, it adds the Istio sidecar to it. Yeah, so normally when you're, when you're deploying Istio, you're using the Istio CTL command line utility, similar to what I did for creating the rules. And you tack this on to the kubectl commands, which you, you're using to create your applications within Kubernetes. And the Istio CTL command essentially just intercepts exactly what you're trying to send to Kubernetes real quick, munges your YAML, uh, reconciles all of it, and then submits that one big YAML with the sidecar tacked on. Uh, and this is something, like I said, if you're trying to update that application now and you didn't remember to also tack on that magical Istio CTL thing at the end, now you're just going to get your application and it can't talk to anything because the sidecar didn't get ejected because you forgot to tack that on. So a lot of the service brokers that people have made for Kubernetes have been more of like the stateful uh, service type of thing, like I want a database. So when you're creating an instance of the database and you're binding an application to the database, the creation of the instance and the binding of your application are, are pretty obvious. Um, but this is basically just a service uh, similar to like a load balancer that you cr would create. Now there is, in a case, maybe some additional steps you'll do to register yourself with the load balancer, say I'm registering from here. Um, but in this example, we really just set up the necessary credentials uh, at a time. It allows you to create new initializers. And then in the binding step is when we actually create the whole deployment. But there's nothing to say that that create instance step couldn't just contain both tasks. Yeah, we, 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 can, we need to think about uh, probably the correct semantics for each particular piece. But uh, for the purposes of a demo, that's what we did. Yep, because it's going to intercept it every time. It's basically like having someone run the Istio CTL for you every time without you having to worry about it. So yeah, this is one thing that I was experimenting with today to try to make the demo work a little more reliably to actually create an ingress. At the moment, I'm using a node port, which makes me think that in some cases, it's getting trapped in the connection tracker and just routing to uh, the Android service. In the demo example before, I set it up properly with some ingress and everything. Um, but for whatever reason, the ingress was just finicky on, on the Wi-Fi. Um, but so, so yeah, because I'm using it on Minikube, um, I just use a node port for now. Normally, you will set up uh, an ingress controller, and Istio even provides an ingress itself that you can use. Um, but like ingress in the Kubernetes sense, some of these things rely on you either having pre-set up uh, the Nginx ingress controller or utilizing your cloud du jour uh, load balancer that they're providing. Um, but having said that, all those things being opened up, the routing between the emulators does work a lot more reliably in the ingress controller sense. When you have like a real IP address, when you have something that's uh, like a real DNS entry mapping and everything. would depend on the, uh, what, what the client's doing with it. So normally, you are opening things that you want to be able to access outside with an ingress controller. Um, and if your clients with inside of the cluster are also using the ingress controller or using Istio and, and using the, the Istio endpoints that are returned when you're 
communicating with Istio. Then uh, they'll get whatever uh, Envoy is directing it to. And that's one of the important parts of, of Istio. Like all traffic is now being redirected once that sidecar is injected to Envoy. Uh, there's IP tables rules that are set up beforehand, which does that. But someone outside of the cluster that has no idea about it could technically call out to Kubernetes in, in the way that you would normally call out to Kubernetes without going through these ingress controllers. And that's really where that external load balancer that is ingress aware is going to come in handy to make sure all these things are programmed correctly. Other questions? Right. So uh, talk to me around. Uh, I look like this. And uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>